<laughs> All right, so I just to shake myself off a little bit. We're moving, we're in movement, and it's incredibly exciting to see you all here today. I was going to say, aren't we supposed to be in a three-year drought in California? Uh, see what happens when Eve comes? <laughs> we're not supposed to have any water. We're not supposed to believe in justice. But guess what? There's water out there. It looks like, sounds like, feels like water. And I think looks like, sounds like, feels like justice is rising, and we're all part of it. <laughs> I want to give Eve a second to talk just a bit about what she's hearing every day. Her cell phone, I think we forced her to leave it outside just for now because it never stops ringing. And it never stops ringing with extraordinary stories. So let me just say that what we're going to be doing this evening is pulling together our movements so that we can, well, move better together. What are we in the way of a global movement? That's what I want Eve to talk about just a bit before we start. And then our conversation is going to be, how do we bring our stories together? What is our vision of the change we're working for? What holds us back from that vision? And what releases us to better help each other, to help all of us get to a place that looks like, smells like, feels like justice? Eve, you can't go through all of your emails right now. No. But a couple. Give us an okay. idea. Well, I just want to say how Utterly thrilling it is to be here with these amazing women on this stage and with all of you. And um, we're literally a week away from One Billion Rising for Justice, so we're in the birth canal as we speak. Um, <laughs> no, we are. We are in the birth canal. And um, I just, I just want to say just a couple, for those, I know Devin introduced One Billion Rising. One Billion Rising really was the most extraordinary thing last year, and I know many people in this room rose um, wherever you rose at the place that you rose at to make that incredible wave of unstoppable energy across the planet. And that has given birth to this year where all our amazing coordinators came together and said, we want to rise for justice. And I have to say, um, what's happening out there, um, literally every minute on my cell phone, um, the things that are coming through are just mind blowing. So I'm going to just tell you a few to start with. But I think the most exciting thing that's happening is this intersectional rising that's occurring. That people are rising at the sites of justice where they need the justice. And they're putting their bodies on the line where they need. And it's absolutely self-directed, autonomously driven in each community around the world. People own this movement everywhere. No one owns it but everyone. And it's a fantastic thing to hear when suddenly there are outcrops here and outcrops here that people are literally determining where they need and what they need to do. And I think the truth is people know what they need to do. They just need global solidarity, which is permission. So I wanted to say a couple of things that are happening. Last night in Peru, um, at their, what is equivalent to their soccer Super Bowl, both teams entered the field with one billion rising t-shirts. <laughs> right? And the, main, and the main newscaster, the sportscaster, knew all about one billion rising. It took 10 minutes to talk about the fact that Peru was rising to end violence against women and girls. It was a front page story. Um, in India, um, all 25 states of India are rising, and India is off the charts. The organizers called me last night, and they were screaming in the phone, and they said, we're, it's gone. It's out of our control. It's gone. Um, but one of the wonderful things is that rickshaw drivers, 100,000 rickshaw drivers, have been sensitized to sexual violence. And in each one of their rickshaws, it will now say, my religion is respecting women. Um, <laughs> Today I saw a video from the Philippines where workers were rising in the middle of ban banana plantations to demand better pay, better wages for women, and to honor women in the fields. Um, uh, I, I have so many things to tell you. Okay. Uh, construction workers in Peru have joined for forces, the union, with the anti-violence forces, and now at every site uh, it says, we are construction workers and we stand to end sexual harassment. This is a safe site for women across the country. Um, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, Fatou Bensada, who's one of the great visionaries of law in the world, um, is rising and the ICC rose and they sent tapes in across the world so the International Criminal Court is in the house. Um, women in Syria are rising um, and they're doing a huge concert to look at what's happened to women and to end the war. Um, soccer players, I told you that, Austrian, uh, Austrian MEPs and many governors, mayors, um, officials, the mayor of New York, the mayor of, of San Francisco are rising and making this an agenda and doing proclamations that it's one billion rising day in, in their cities. Um, 
Kenyan activists are rising to end underage marriage and to stop female genital mutilation. And I will say across Gambia, Egypt, and many countries where there is FGM, there are major risings to stop it. We're seeing the intersection of indigenous women rising at mines in the Philippines and other countries where land is being taken away and the land is being militarized. So what we're seeing across the planet, and it, it's really startling because like today in New York, schools in New York, youth in New York started rising. And it, it's like outcrop. Suddenly Cyprus is in the house and Dubai is in the house. So, so we're, we're all, all on the phone like watching this global, mad, in the body, in the present, in the now for justice. And I think we're really seeing something that's never really ever happened on the planet, um, that people have owned this movement, taken this movement, and are creating justice. So I'm thrilled to be on this panel tonight with these amazing women to really elucidate what justice is and how we do it together. All right. Thank you, Eve. And thank you, everybody, not just in the room, but everybody who's watching on the live stream. We are now live streaming around the planet. And let's just say the first time that we live streamed one of these State of Female, originally it was America panels, um, people got the idea all across the country, all across the world. And since then, people have held their own State of Female Justice panels in Manila, in Miami, in Santa Fe, in Dubai, in Delhi, you name it, there have been panels like this. So if you're watching on the live stream and you were part of a State of Female Justice panel, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. We want these events to model the kind of thinking and exchanging we need to do. Yes, we need to put our bodies on the line. We also need to put our brains in gear and stretch ourselves a little bit to figure out how the justice that we dream of includes all of us. So let's start with what brings us into this room. What gets us to do the work that we have? We have extraordinary panelists, Susan Burton next to Eve Ensler. Um, long bios you'll find in your hands out, but suffice to say, she's one of the founders of the New Way of Life Recovery Project. She'll tell us more about what she does. Next to her, Mayor Gail McLaughlin from Richmond, California. Mayor McLaughlin. If Susan Burton is using the power of recovery and the power of experience, Mayor McLaughlin is using the power of public office, imagine, to make change. <laughs> Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, you know from UCLA, we also claim her in New York at Columbia. <laughs> the power of law. And next to her, Olivia Wilde, who, among other things, is my cousin. <laughs> the power of celebrity and conscience, right there. Olivia. Next to Olivia is Ashley Franklin. I couldn't be happier to have Ashley with us, an organizer from right here in LA, who is right now. She's right now the organizer behind the new community rights campaign coming out of the Strategy Center. Glad to have you all. So let's start with you, Susan. What's the What's the injustice that you grapple with? What is the injustice that brings you into this room? Over the last 30 years, I've watched the rise of the rate of incarceration for women. And I, worked with, and I work with the women who are leaving prisons, coming back to the community. And as I uh, talk with them and as I read their letters asking for help, um, I see the injustices that they've experienced. We talk about second chances. We talk about giving people a second chance, a break. But when I read the letters and I sit and I talk with the women, what I know is what they're getting is a first chance. There was one letter in particular that was written to me. And she says, I'm 35 years old. My mother died when I was five. Then my father raped me so bad I had to learn to walk again. He's serving life. I've been in 48 group homes, mental institution and behavior centers. At 21, I, I began to use PCP and crack. I've watched the, 
the violence in prison. I've watched a beating by police and beating by women on women and the horror and the uh, uh, racism and the discrimination. She said, but I'm not a, a victim, I'm a survivor. And I'm ready, I'm ready to change at this point in my life. And I need your help. She said, I want to rise. And I want to stand. And I want to help women who just need a chance. And that keeps me. Those types of letters. Those types of conversations. Over 65% of women disclose in prison that there has been some form of violence prior to incarceration. And do what do we do? How do we respond? How do we react to it? So um, that keeps me hooked, plugged in, and rising, standing, working, and fighting for justice. You're right there. You want to go next? I am just delighted to be here and um, to share with you some of, some of the stories that, that I deal with, that I witness in my city of Richmond, California. Um, Richmond is a majority um, people of color community. We have 40% Latinos and 26% African Americans, about 6% Asians. Um, we have a long, long history of poverty, racial injustice, social injustice. Um, economic injustice, um, environmental injustice. So we have come from this history. We are in the process of transformation, but we still have the pain, we still have the suffering. And here's the story, here's one example. Um, we've been in the process of changing for a while now. We're, we have a progressive alliance in our city. Some of us are elected as a result of the efforts of our Richmond Progressive Alliance. Um, but you know, we, you have those setbacks and you have the, the challenges of, a, of systemic problems to deal with. And in 2009, a horrible, a horrific situation happened to a 16-year-old um, young, young woman in Richmond High. Um, she was uh, gang raped and uh, she, uh, in addition to being gang raped for over two hours, um, she, there were bystanders around that did not go to the police. And um, the young woman who did go to the police, you know, we honored as a hero, and of course she was. Now, that is the horrific part of, of it, the, the, the horrificness of the crime. But to add to that horrificness, Richmond got all this negative attention nationwide, and it was targeted on all of our youth. It was like there were people calling and saying, the young people in Richmond are animals. And it was just horrendous because our youth were clearly not going to stand for that. Our, the, the vast majority of our youth, were, especially from Richmond High, were not going to stand for that. Um, what they did was organize marches, rallies, press conferences. They said, they held up banners saying, we are Richmond. They shifted the, the message that the press had. They shifted it completely. They turned it into a learning moment. They, they shared that rape is a systemic problem. They researched it. They put out the statistics that one woman every two minutes is sexually assaulted in the US. So they took that. It was the power of mobilization, the power of people. And that's how we make change in Richmond. Uh, the injustices um, sadly still remain, but we use them as learning, learning moments and we turn them around. Kim, you want to go next? What, what keeps me moving, um, thinking, reaching, um, is the desire to address intersectional causes of injury and to think about how our politics don't always allow us to see what happens in the intersections. Um, so uh, just to, to build off of what Susan said, um, if we look at the uh, anti-violence movement, we look at the anti-incarceration movement, we would think 
that that statistic that Susan just mentioned, the fact that the majority of women who are incarcerated have a history of abuse, would show up in both movements. And, and in fact, it frequently doesn't. Um, so what, what keeps me going is trying to find those moments, those opportunities to tell stories about how intersectional failures in our politics um, constitute injuries uh, that we all end up suffering from. So we were supposed to tell a story. So here's my story of the first intersectional, um, not the first, but one that, that I think keeps giving us gifts um, <laughs> over, over the years. So um, I was one of the people who was on Anita Hill's um, defense team. And I say defense advisedly. She shouldn't have had to have a defense team, but she certainly did. Um, and for some of you who weren't born yet, um, <laughs> the, the controversy had to do with Anita Hill uh, testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee that uh, Clarence Thomas, then a nominee for the Supreme Court, uh, had sexually harassed her. Um, what was particularly um, uh, earth shattering for us who were uh, uh, representing her uh, was thinking on one hand that we were defending um, an African-American woman, defending uh, the African-American community, yet to find out when we came out of the Capitol, it was surrounded by African-Americans, many of them women, um, many of them praying uh, for Clarence Thomas to be uh, confirmed as against this woman who was framed as essentially a white woman. Um, in addition, there was an op-ed that was written in the New York Times that basically said that Anita Hill was acting white um, by uh, claiming that she'd been sexually harassed. Um, and that sexual harassment was a white woman's issue, not an African-American woman's issue. Now, at, at that moment, it became clear to me a couple of things. Number one, that our history of uh, sexual abuse um, as African-American women was not part of the recognized history of racism mm -hmm. among African-Americans. It became clear to me that people didn't know that Rosa Parks, before she stood up for racial justice, actually stood up for African-American rape victims in the South um, who experienced gang rapes without the possibility uh, of their perpetrators ever being prosecuted. So what was clear is that there was this radical disconnection uh, between the history of anti-racism and the history of feminism, so much that many people didn't know that sexual harassment was initially a claim that was made by African-American women, a claim that was based on the fact that our history in this country has been one of sexual harassment in the place of work. So my sense is that we as a community have lost momentum many times by intersectional failures, and they come back to haunt us. So every 5-4 decision that destroys the Voting Rights Act, that destroys access that women have to Title VII, that destroys affirmative action, in a way, it's a self-inflicted injury that comes from intersectional failures, the inability to see how race, gender, and class come together. Thank you. Down with intersectional failure, that's what I say. No more of it. Let's talk, Olivia, about your story. What do you deal with on a daily basis, on well, a justice basis? I think offering my voice here as a representative of the media, which is often, I think, fairly criticized for being a big part of the problem when it comes to justice for women, equality for women, how women are objectified, how we objectify ourselves. I think a lot about where that problem is stemming from. Our responsibility is to be storytellers. And why aren't we telling the stories that are educating the masses to empower them to avoid a lot of these situations? Seems like that's really part of the healing process is communities coming together and empowering themselves through the power of a group and understanding that they don't have to put up with that shit anymore. Why isn't that coming from the media? Why aren't women in particular being empowered from a young age from the media? So I'm really interested in that, and I think it's not entirely surprising since within the media, within Hollywood, they can't even figure out their own system of injustice. Um, and that is something that I confront on a day-to-day -day basis, as any woman working in any level, of any part of Hollywood will tell you. It's really hard to get stories made that are about women, not just women being obsessed with men or supporting men. And it's really hard to get men to be a part of films that are about women in a leading role. Um, 
And I have countless stories about that. But I'm really interested in how we can adjust that, considering that it's all based on the demand. Movies are made based on what people are asking for. Magazines are sold based on what they think people are asking for. So really, the power is in our hands. Uh, and it's just a matter of really asking for it much louder. Um, so yeah, that's. You had told me a story about a, a reading that you'd been part of that was revealed. Yeah, really fascinating. I don't know if any of you have been to some of these live reads at LACMA, where uh, a classic film is read by actors live on stage who just sit and read the script. And we did one recently of American Pie, which I just realized some of you may be too young to see, and I had a mini heart attack. But no, that's probably not true, right? Yeah. So American Pie, but we reversed the gender roles. So all women played men, all men played women. And it was so fascinating to be a part of this, because as the women took on these central roles that had all the good lines, therefore all the good laughs, all the great moments, the men who had joined us to sit on stage started squirming rather uncomfortably and got really bored because they weren't <laughs> used to being the supporting cast. And it was fascinating to feel their discomfort, to discuss it with them afterwards when they said, this, it's boring to play the girl role. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, you think? Welcome to our world. It was also fascinating to see how the movie was just as entertaining and hilarious and exciting with women saying these roles, that it didn't seem awkward to see a woman saying a, one line, that it was something that clearly should be done more often, that when we switch the roles, as has been done with movies, you know, many of you probably know that in Alien, Sigourney Weaver's role was written for a man, in Salt, Angelina Jolie's role was written for Tom Cruise, these things, when reversed, do prove to be just as exciting and entertaining with women in leading roles. But I think it's something that is still just at the beginning stages in Hollywood. Um, it's very difficult to get a movie financed with a woman in a leading role. And that's something that now, as a producer, I'm starting to really become familiar with. So these are things that I have to change in order for the media to be a positive force for people all around the world, because it is incredible the reach of media. I was in Senegal recently on a, I'm, this sounds like I'm making it up, but I swear to God, on a camel in Senegal in the middle of the desert when the guy who was helping me not fall off my camel said, you're Dr. 13 on house. <laughs> and I just realized like, we have to do a better job of representing different lifestyles and women in, in empowered roles because literally everybody is seeing the stuff that we put out, so we have to be more responsible about what we do put out. Yeah. Thank you. Ashley, to you, this question of who gets to speak, who gets to be heard, who gets to be taken seriously. You've got some extraordinary stories up your sleeve. Um, tell us the injustice story first. What brings you here? For sure. Um, so. I think that I should start a little bit about where I'm from. So I'm from South Central Los Angeles, and um, as we all know that people in South LA are rising up um, because there are many injustices um, ranging from poverty, ranging from um, not having access to a quality education, and ranging and also the criminalization of our community in a real way. So disinvestment, but putting police inside of our communities. Um, so coming from that background, I intentionally chose to go to an all-women's college. I went to Scripps College in Claremont. And I wanted to have those conversations around patriarchy, capitalism, um, poverty, <laughs> class. And um, I found myself really intrigued by everything that I was learning. Um, but I wanted to take those conversations further. I wanted to take action. So I found myself, um, now I'm a community organizer, <laughs> through a class that I took there. And I found myself back where I was from, in my neighborhood. And I was organizing on the buses. And just to give you a, a little landscape of the buses, bus systems here in Los Angeles, it's comprised of 60% women. Uh, my majority of them are immigrant women. Um, the average or annual income for the women on the buses are $15,000 or less per year. Um, and the majority of the women on the bus are black, Latino, and API. So 
When I was on the bus, I would hear different stories from women talking about their long journeys, an hour, two hours it would take them to get from their neighborhoods to other neighborhoods like West, West LA, um, to downtown, to be domestic workers, to clean and work really hard. Um, but I think the stories that resonated most with me um, is when they're leaving work, and oftentimes it's after sunset, um, way after sunset, and they find themselves at the bus stop waiting 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, sometimes two hours, to find out that their bus isn't coming. Um, and their bus line has been cut, but let's be real, um, no one has informed them that that bus isn't coming. And so, although they're put in this predicament where they're waiting for these buses, you know, MTA, our metro, our metro system, um, also continues to increase the fares. They also cut, continue to cut the service um, in, in a, an attempt to create a world-class bus system. Um, but the question at hand is, what type of bus system is this? Who is it going to benefit, right? Is it going to benefit the women who, are make, who pay $75 a month and having to choose, do I feed my kid or do I actually pay for my bus pass so I can get to work? Is it going to benefit um, the, the woman who is making very hard decisions about where am I going to live now? Because after, you know, rail is built in my neighborhood, gentrification is real, rent is high, so where am I supposed to go and live? So when I think about all of these connecting, and if we want to talk about intersectionality, which I was definitely on when I was in college. Um, if we want to talk about that, I think we have to broaden the idea of what is violence. Poverty is violence. Racism is violence. Patriarchal capitalism is violence. So I, I think that's one of the things that I really, what resonates with me with injustice. Well, so to elaborate on that a little bit, what are the consequences for the women that you watched on the bus, for the women riding on the bus? So I think the consequences are very um, grave in the sense that sometimes women, they're walking, right? They have to walk home. And I'm, I don't know if you all know, but you know, walking home in LA, pretty much, it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think, uh, and I'll just speak from my own experience, walking home when your bus does not come um, I'm usually traditionally not afraid of the people inside of my neighborhood, but a real thing here in Los Angeles is we need to think about police. Um, I don't think that when police officers see um, women walking home, particularly black, Latino, and API communities, um, it's an issue of safety. I think that the thing that I know I think about is like when I see officers inside of my community, are they there um, to protect me or do they see me as a threat to safety? Um, and I think the latter is what most women experience. So, you know, I think that's one huge thing that, you know, women are facing. But another thing in which I, I probably shouldn't switch so quickly to this, but I think it's real anger. <laughs> and when you have that anger, it makes you rise up and it makes you fight. So <laughs> women, um, although experiencing these conditions, you either can be content with it or you can decide that you're going to fight against mm -hmm. it. And you see it as something that's institutional, mm -hmm. right? You see the structures at hand and then you say, we all have something in common, these collective stories. Mm -hmm. And we need to join together and we fight back. And, th and that's why we have something like the Bus Riders Union and that's why we have organizers in the street because of these women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Susan, coming back to you again for a second. Talk institutions. Talk institutional structures. Um, is it just accident that the women that you see every day end up, like as you did, rotating in and out of recidivism? What are the policies, and the, maybe the attitudes? What about the media, perhaps, that play a role in setting things up this way? It's just not accident. You know, after myself cycling in and out of prison half a dozen times, I found a place in Santa Monica. And that opened up a wealth of services, a wealth of resources, a safe place, counseling, therapy, uh, treatment, um, smiles. 
And I just put, I'm like, why isn't this in South LA? And how long had it been before you found them? Six prison terms, 20 years. You know, my son, I lost a son, uh, accidentally killed by a police officer. I drank, I used drugs. Had you looked for I help? went to prison. Had you looked for help in those 20 years? I didn't know what grief was. I didn't know what help was. I just kind of circled, uh, you know, just uh, into a deep, dark place. Why wasn't there some place that I could go to in South LA to get help? But when I found it, yeah, yeah, all that. <laughs> Rise. <laughs> but when I found it, I'm like, what is this? Why isn't it in South LA? It's not by, by mistake or chance. Our folks know what we need. Our elected officials know what, he need, what we need. I advocate strongly for it, you know, uh, uh, today being on the other side. So um, it's not by accident that we have more police than parks and, and, and schools and, and uh, art programs and uh, uh, soccer fields and, and so forth. It's not by mistake. So. Um, that's why we rise. That's why we fight for what we want in our communities. So the Labor Strategy Center, A New Way of Life, uh, All of Us and None, V-Day, that's why we stand, fight, and organize uh, to have a collective voice to make what needs to happen everywhere happen. Um, so that was the impetus mm -hmm. for creating A New Way of Life. Gail, coming to you, I read a statistic recently about the number, the proportion of African Americans who live within, I think, a quarter of a mile of some toxic site, whether it's a, a factory or a refinery. You have a huge refinery in your district, in your town of Richmond, the Chevron Refinery. What are the institutional and policy underpinnings for where we locate these factories, where we locate people, who lives there, who has a voice, and whose health matters? Yes, well, we do. Richmond is home to the second largest oil refinery in California, the Chevron Richmond Oil Refinery, which, um, you know, causes a host of problems, including a massive fire in 2012 that sent 15,000 local residents to be treated at local hospitals. Um, we are suing Chevron, the city of Richmond, and we are forcing regulation. Um, the refinery was actually there before the city incorporated. Um, where uh, It's clear that refineries locate in low-income areas. Um, the environmental injustice is very clear. You know, the, the people around the refinery are largely people of color. Uh, totally low income and uh, it's there hasn't been a refinery um, built in the in the United States since 1976 that's because communities don't want them in their neighborhood and and rightly so I mean they are a harm and they are a risk for the community so Chevron exists in Richmond they they're there so it is up to incumbent on us to hold them accountable. The underpinnings are that uh, it's a corporate culture. It's a corporate culture that puts its profit, profits first over human needs, over the community that exists around them. Um, Chevron makes anywhere from 25 to $30 billion in profits a year. And people living around the refinery, people throughout Richmond, we're a working class community. We have a large poverty rate. We have, um, massive amounts of um, challenges. But we've learned to, um, because of our progressive movement, uh, it's, you know, many, of, many talked about the power of, of movements and mobilizations. Um, we have been able to change that. But you also have to have people in office that are willing to stand side by side with the community. And that's what the Richmond Progressive Alliance, which is a great organization that I helped co-found and it runs progressive candidates every year and every two years. And I was elected um, in 2004, in 2006, in 2000, 
and 10 uh, re-elected as mayor. So, um, and it was done without a penny of corporate money because we wanted to make sure that, that we stood, you know, those of us who, who run as RPA candidates, that we are making it clear to people we stand with mm. you. We stand for your needs and not for the corporate needs. For, unfortunately, we still have office holders in Richmond that are in the pocket of Chevron. Chevron friendly uh, candidates and Chevron has put countless uh, dollars into our electoral arena every year, millions of dollars. We, some of us have been able to win anyway. You know, we go door to door, we build that movement. They have, Chevron has had some successes as well. Um, but uh, this is the institutional problem that mm. we have nationwide, worldwide, the corporate culture polluting our air, in the case of oil companies, but also polluting our democracy. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we have big banks after us now in Richmond. Um, so because we have this eminent domain program that we want to uh, help our homeowners. Mm -hmm. But we're going to keep pushing back. And mm -hmm. we do it together. We do it with a movement, a grassroots movement of people. Myself as mayor, another elected official. Nobody can do it alone. Well, let you me need that side by side. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Let me bring Eve in on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, your most recent book, In the Body of the World, also addresses this question of the body in relation to the phenomena that, that Gail is talking about. What are you seeing in, in, in the way of that connection as you do this organizing? Well, I, was just, I just want to go back to a little bit what Susan was talking about, because um, I was thinking about prisons. And, and, and I was. And they're, they're, they're the girls. Let me, let me just ask um, the women. Uh, I want to thank you for coming out and just to give you a shout out and say thank you for coming to UCLA. I see, I see some people who could generously offer you a much better seat. <laughs> <They're good. laughs> it, it, it's, it's chivalry death. Just checking. I don't think chivalry is entirely dead. And I'm actually kind of in favor of a certain kind of chivalry. <laughs> Thank you. But I was just thinking when um, Susan was talking, um, I spent a long time working and, and being with women in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in upstate New York. I, I ran a wonderful writing group there for years. And one of the things I was thinking about justice is, 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 is it's about care. It's about care. It's about caring for people. It's about caring that people are living next to poisonous dump sites and caring what happens to people and what brings people to do things. And one of the things I was thinking when you were saying there's nothing in your community to help you, there's nothing in prisons to help you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we put away two to three million people in the prisons in this country and there is nothing there to help people transform or get in touch with their pain or get in touch of where they've come from. And I think part of what we're, we're seeing in America uh, and in such a profound way is this polluted system that's been corporately taken over that has rid us yes. of care, of care, of just basic care. If you're looking at the fact that 60% of people in prison have been beaten or raped or undone by one of the forms of violence we're talking about, why wouldn't prisons be the perfect place mm -hmm. to transform and support and love people back into a new consciousness? Wouldn't they be the place to do that? Why can't we turn them into places of transformation mm -hmm. and places of support and places of love? And that goes for the same thing about the body because, you know, one of the things I experienced when I got stage three, stage four cancer is I became aware of how disconnected I had been from my body my whole life. After being raped by my father, after being beaten on a regular, everyday basis by my father, I left my body. I couldn't live in here. It was too terrible, scary a landscape. And once you disassociate from your body, you can do anything and have anything be done to your body because you're not living it anymore. I became promiscuous, I became a drug addict, I became an alcoholic, I went in very bad paths because I wasn't in here anymore. Yes. I couldn't be here. How many women, how many men have left their body due to the violences that has been done mm -hmm. to them? And part of what I experienced when I got cancer and I woke up after a nine hour surgery and I had tubes coming out of every part of my body, is I suddenly was body. I was here. I was home. And I couldn't believe the difference. I couldn't believe the difference. 
And what I came to understand through that journey is when I came back into my body, I felt the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It was in my body. I felt the rape of the women in Congo, who was in my body. I felt the rape of my sisters and the abuse of my sisters in all the prisons, because it's in my body. When we're not in our bodies, we don't connect to each other, because yes. we're not in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so the work is how do we come back into this body, the body of our body, the body of our culture, the body of the world, the body of the earth. I was so disconnected from the earth. I was a city person. I saw little mang mangy trees going up. I thought that was nature. That's not nature, okay? <laughs> That's not nature, okay? Nature fills you with her. The mother is so powerful and beautiful and green and alive. And I couldn't connect because I couldn't connect inside me. How do we all help each other get back into our bodies? Thank you. Um, uh, sure. Olivia, I want to come to you on this question. Uh, you are an actress. People project onto you and your body. Um, you, are not, you are sharing your body right now <laughs> with a, a new person that's coming along. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But have you ever felt like you had to leave your body in the way that Eve's talking about and able to be able to do your job of being in your yeah, field? Yeah, it's such a fascinating concept, the disassociation from yourself in order to allow in order to allow that to happen. I, I think that it took me 10 years in this business to realize I didn't have to do that. Mm. It, and I feel like I started out as a smart person, a, 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 a really you know, empowered woman, uh, educated, and yet still entering into this business, I thought, oh, this is just the way the system works. As an actress, you first have to appeal. First, they have to find you pretty. That gets you through a certain door. Then they have to find you sexy. That gets you through a certain door. Then you have to be uh, appealing to a certain amount of people. And this is all going to get you to a place where then you can be valued for something else, which is not true. You can start at that end point. But there, even for, I think, smart, self-possessed young women, there is the idea that you have to buy into some sort of structure, some sort of system in order to be valued. Um, the kind of a really crass example of this, because I'm sure you've heard lots of gross stories about Hollywood, but one of my first jobs was this really awful TV show. And it was, thank God it didn't last very long, but I had auditioned for the role and then not gotten it. And then I got a call saying, actually, you did get it. And I was like, great, they must have you know, watch the tapes again and realize how brilliant I am. <laughs> I go on set, I get there, and I find out from someone on set that the other girl who had been hired had been fired because the executive in charge, who was a very powerful producer, had decided she, quote, wasn't fuckable. <gasps> and my heart sank as I was like, oh, so I'm like the fuckable choice? And that's why I'm here? And it was really proven to me the first night of shooting when I was so excited, getting ready to shoot our first scene. We were at Mel's Diner in Hollywood. And I was getting ready, and that same producer did a kind of sachet walkthrough of the set to kind of check things out. Took a look at me, nodded hello, went away. And suddenly, a wardrobe person came up to me nervously and said, um, we just need to make a little adjustment. And I was like, what did he say? What happened? She's like, just, just going to fix a little something. And of course, it was like, she needs tits. Put some tits on this girl. Another quote. Wow. So then it was like I had immediately been plunged into the boiling water, right? Like I had immediately seen the worst side of it. But it didn't make me balk and say, like, what is this? This is outrageous and I want no part of it. For some reason, I was like, OK, this is weird. Hollywood's weird. I guess I'll just kind of like stay here and figure it out for a while and like kind of I will remove myself from it in that way that you're saying in the way that Eve is describing I'll remove myself from it so it doesn't get to me I'll give them this I'll give them my body so but I'm not being affected in truth you are being affected it is eating away at you but it did took it took me years and years and years to realize like no one has to put up with that shit no matter how young they are and the really great stuff that you want to be doing doesn't involve any of those stupid people anyway but it, it's really sad to me that what gets put out there is a total uh, acceptance of that type of thinking. Um, and I think what really turned it for me were role models. 
which is what really turns it for all of us. And no matter if you are a woman in prison or an actress in Hollywood, it's a role model who wakes you up to your power. I see it. So that's what I'm really interested in doing. Yeah. Kim, do you want to come in on this? Was there well, you know, I, I was thinking about the theme of alienation and, and evacuation, mm -hmm. the evacuation of the body, um, and its relationship to the evacuation of the body politic, mm -hmm. like how it is that some of the political ways that we conceptualize women's politics or anti-racist politics enact an evacuation of those bodies that actually have a place in all of these politics. Um, so I was thinking, for example, um, when we talk about uh, uh, violence in, in, within our communities, um, or we talk about the school to prison pipeline, or we talk about mass incarceration, and that's framed as a racial justice issue, many times the only bodies that are imagined to be subject to those problems are male bodies, right? Um, so we wouldn't know. Um, that the group that has the highest rate of violent victimization is not actually men. It's African American girls between the ages of 12 and 15. No one knows that, right? Nobody knows that. Or if we think about um, economic disempowerment, um, uh, President Obama just uh, last week did a classic intersectional evacuation of women of color. Um, in one sentence he talked about uh, the need to create foundations, uh, foundations get interested in African American and, and Latino men um, creating new policies to create more economic attachment. And in the next paragraph, he talked about um, women uh, making 77 cents on a dollar. The one conversation about African Americans and Latinos was male. The conversation about economic um, uh, disparities was white. What we don't know is what's going on with women of color. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know um, that African American women, the median net wealth of African American women is $100. That means 50% of African American women are uh, uh, economically are worth nothing or less. For Latinas, it's $120, right? You wouldn't know that in many of the conversations about um, the, the economy, um, uh, the ticking up of the unemployment um, or, or the reduction of unemployment. And if you turn it around and looked at what was happening with women, if you look at um, women's political participation, uh, a lot of the conversation about the election was women gave the White House to President Obama. Well, which women gave the White House to President Obama? The majority of white women did not vote for President Obama. Um, the women's vote is a women of color vote. And if that gets evacuated from our politics, it creates some of these absences. It creates the belief that uh, feminism is not for women of color. Uh, it creates the belief that mass incarceration is not an issue around women. When in fact, women of color are in feminist politics by their vote, and women of color are in mass incarceration by what's happening to them. So reversing this evacuation is bringing this consciousness to our everyday politics, recognizing the intersectional vulnerabilities that women of color and everyone faces, and recognizing that the political power that we have as women, as people of color, comes together when we recognize that we have mutual interest and we have mutual power that is broader and wider when we speak together. Ashley, you said the majority of the organizers that you work with, whether it's on the bus riders campaign or the community change campaign, are women and girls. Um, why? Yeah, I think that's a funny question. <laughs> um, and this is that, you know, some people say, well, women are best at organizing and they're, <laughs> some people they're say just that. ready to fight, right? Um, but I think, you know, when, I think it's true, one. <laughs> but two, I think well, we have to acknowledge state-induced violence um, in the sense that we have to see how our communities are under attack. And let me give you an example of that, because I heard a lot of things being thrown around and like getting back into one's body. 
And what does that mean? And once you're there, what do you do with it? Um, so I know that along with the Bus Riders Union, we fight uh, against the school to prison pipeline. Um, and we fight against the mass incarceration of black and Latino folks. Um, and the way we do that is at the high school level. And so the same women that we find on the bus include young women as well. So when young women would get off the bus and they were tardy to school, mind you, MTA buses never run on time if you've ever taken one, um, they would receive a $250 to $1,000 ticket. Wait, wait, wait. Did everybody hear that? When they're tardy, <laughs> when they're late, like how late? Um, it could be when the school bell rings, so two minutes, three minutes, um, 10 minutes. Just depends <laughs> when the school bell rings. So you're, you're late. Two minutes late, and you get a ticket for how much? $250 to a $1,000 ticket. But I want to go deeper than that because it wasn't just a ticket. You get off the bus, you're handcuffed, you're walked through, you're searched, you're walked through your, your school. So think about this process as a very dehumanizing process. Yes. And I, if we want to take it much bigger than that and think about institutional structures, this is going on when California is number one in prison spending and 47 in education spending, right. right? This is going on when we have the largest school police department in the nation. Um, this is going on when we see that we only graduate 50% of our high school students. So thinking about what they're experiencing as women, I think that this getting into one's body and understanding like what has happened to me isn't basically my fault, but looking at the institutional structures at hand that helps create, facilitate, and perpetuate the harms that we're seeing inside of our communities. So young people have been the number one fighters inside of their community in the sense that they've gotten LAPD, Los Angeles School Police Department, for people who don't know, <laughs> Los, Ange Los Angeles School Police Department, Los Angeles Police Department, the courts, they've gotten um, the school district and city council, young people who don't have the right to vote, and they fought, fought like crazy. They organized like crazy, and they basically amended the law. So the very people who you find are the ones who are willfully defiant, the ones that deserve the tickets as they've quoted, were the ones who actually stood up for change and actually made things happen That's right. inside of their That's community. Right. So. All right. <laughs> There's so many places for us to go with this conversation, but I do, before we go further into the tools in our toolbox for organizing and for stretching our, our, our experience, I want to talk just a little bit about how each of you deals with what holds us back from some of the kind of work that we're talking about. Um, I mean, Olivia, to come back to you for a second, we saw this last couple of weeks. Uh, Dylan Farrow coming forward and speaking. What's the very first thing I hear in a taxi when I'm driving from the airport was, well, I don't believe her. People make up stories all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, really? There's an epidemic of false rape allegations you know, out there, or accusations out there? I don't think so. We know there's an epidemic of rape. Mm -hmm. um, talk a bit about what we consider, you know, what holds us back from being the kind of outspoken person that we each need to be to claim the power that we have, because it is in our most powerful places of intersection, of being in our body, that we tend to get most quickly cut off, uh, whether it's through being divided from one another, being told to not trust one another, or physically being abused in our power. Fear, I think fear of being alone in that, fear of speaking out and then being proven wrong, fear of losing something because of it. And I think that's why, you know, obviously the power of community organizing creates movements because people no longer feel afraid to be doing it alone. Mm -hmm. But it starts with this one person, then a small group of people, then a bigger group saying, this is what we believe. It's not the popular opinion yet, but it should be because it's right. We believe it's right and we can argue that. And I, I, I think it's fascinating how quickly people will try to smother their instincts because of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's also interesting, the double standard we were discussing just a little bit of, ago about privacy, about the idea of, oh, when 
when we are afraid to address something, it's very easy to make up an excuse why we shouldn't be addressing it. So in this case, it's like, let's all not poke into the issue of, of Woody Allen and whether or not he is guilty. Let's, this is a private family issue. It's really none of our business. But we have no problem poking into lots of other things that are truly none of our business um, and create an entire industry around poking into and ripping people of their privacy. So I, I think that, that people do instinctually know what's right mm. and what they shouldn't be looking at and what they should be and what they should stand up for. But fear will hold us back from everything. You were nodding, uh, Susan. Let's, yes. hear, let's hear from, I mean, I, know, I, I think about- How do you get through? I think about back in 1998 when I first started A New Way of Life. And what I did is I offered women a safe place, drug and free, uh, a f drug, f a f free of drug and alcohol environment. Someone used to come there and throw rocks in the night at the house. Mm. So there was a total uh, dislike um, or strong, yeah, hate for what was happening there, that people were just given an opportunity and a chance. Wow. And then I think about where I've come today, 16 years down the road, 700 women down the road. And, you know, the, the, the statement I read was from um, uh, a leadership uh, a, a training called Women Organizing for Justice. You know, and, and at the end of the letter, um, this, woman, th this woman writes that I have faith and I have love after all I've been through. She didn't say that, but I'm thinking after all she's been through, she's connected with faith and love and in her body. So some people say it doesn't affect me. But if it happens to you, it happens to me mm -hmm. because we're all interconnected. So, you know... Those directly affected and facing and understanding uh, what, what, what happens to people, what happens to you. I mean, you have to leave your body when you're taken into one of those uh, prisons or, 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 or you're going to stand up. And if you stand up, you get knocked down and stomped and so forth. So you have to exit. Mm -hmm. But those that are directly affected, I believe, are really coming forward, taking the charge mm -hmm. and understanding what it means to our entire community and to our world and have to make um, a, organize themselves to stop what's happening and speak up and speak out against it. Well, are we all interconnected? Gail, I mean, to you as mayor, you must be constantly being told you have a, a zero-sum game in the way of a budget. You're either spending over here or you're, not spend, or you're spending over here. If we really were to address the situation of people living around the plant, well, what would that mean for our taxes? Mm -hmm. Chevron is a huge taxpayer. If we were to really address foreclosure, uh, what would that mean? Uh, can't we leave it over there? It's just their problem. I mean, aren't we, are we actually interconnected? Don't we constantly say, not in my backyard, but theirs? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in reality, in Richmond, what I have um, worked at, and I've worked side by side with a community that that is rich in, um, in its desire to see change um, is to indeed say that yes, we can and we need to unify and we need to address our problems at the root causes of them. So therefore, you know, we have to say we need more taxes from Chevron. Yes, we, we, uh, Chevron gives a, um, a large uh, portion of our budget, but not nearly enough as they should, given that they make $26 billion in profits. So we have to continuously put the um, blame where it belongs and have our community recognize that every single member of the community has a right to have all, all its needs, all his or her needs met. And so this is something, an, an education. Um, and we do it in Richmond, and we, we have opposition. You know, the more gains we made, the, the more um, pushback we get from Chevron. We won a $114 million tax settlement from them in 2010, and they spent millions in the next election to try and, you know, defeat candidates. They spent um, millions to try and defeat my reelection. But, you know, we believe that the people know what's in their own interest. So... Um, 
Yes, it's, um, it, it's a scenario that you have to continuously educate. We have to educate each other to show that our interests are with one another. And that means we have to access the pain that we all have because I mean, aside from the 1%, the corporate um, elite in this, in this country, um, the rest of us are oppressed to one level or another. There is the intersectionality that is a very complex thing, and one has to understand that and, and deeply um, reach out and, and you know, bond with, with people at whatever level of, um, of pain and suffering. But every one of us has some level of pain and suffering. And the media would have us, you talk about being not inside your body or um, being alienated. The media, the corporate media, would have us continuously, uh, you know, just fight with one another, have this competitive, um, and each one trying for a competitive advantage. Women, you know, who looks best? This is what you need to, to, to look a certain way. Um, you know, men, you're, you know, you're supposed to be, you know, always thinking of uh, sexual conquests. You know, that's why we have rapes, because we have, we have the systemic messages that are being fed to us. Um, and we have to overcome them by dealing with the roots of our problems, which is the corporate media, corporate advertisers. And also we have to reach each other at the level of our pain, we have to acknowledge that. In so many cases, people have a battering no-win situation, and they disassociate. And that's for, for you know, protection, self-protection. And we have to say, you know, we are stronger together. So let's, let's come together, understand we, we have pain in our lives. Let's tear off the masks that the corporate media want us to, to keep wearing. And let's uh, create authentic human relationships. So this is, my role as mayor is very much to uh, set a tone for that kind of movement. Um, I consider myself an activist mayor. I think we should have more activist elected <laughs> officials. <laughs> By now, a lot of people are saying, well, which party does she belong to? <laughs> Tell us. I, I'm a member of the Green, the Green Party, um, but so it's, you know, to me, I, I really do believe we need a strong third party um, because I do think both the Democrats and the Republicans are too uh, involved with corporations. And I, um, I'm not saying the Green Party is it. I would like to see a strong third party that has progressive Democrats coming into it, has Green Party members coming into it, has peace and freedom. Um, members coming into it, but a party that really understands mm. the values that we all need to hold and build a movement together um, to, to make the, the, to really stand for the, the right social layer, not the corporate layer, but the people layer. Beautiful. So. Yes. So, so thank you, Gail. Gail, you're taking us to, to visions. I would like to see kind of places. Kim. The I would like to see movement of your intersectional dreams. Um, <laughs> believe me, she has intersectional dreams. Uh, what's it look like? How is it different yeah. from what we've got now? Well, um, <laughs> intersectional healing. <laughs> that too. <We're> <laughs> um, <laughs> The, I, I think the principal way in, in which it would be different is, is first of all, the, the thing that holds us back would be put under our feet. And that is, I, I think that we don't want to be seen as out of fashion, politically and theoretically. Um, so we would have to be willing not only to embrace being anti-racist, being feminist, being anti-heterosexist, but also going beyond that to, to what even I've been calling quantum feminism, right? Um, what is the practice of intersectionality? It's quantum feminism, quantum anti-racism. Um, I, I was at a place uh, at, at a college maybe a couple months ago um, where I'd been brought in um, they had done some kind of a campus climate and found that uh, students of color 
and women did not feel safe, did not feel comfortable. There were all sorts of uh, events that had happened on campus, and the morale was really low. Um, and so I was talking to a group, small group of, of leaders across all the different groups, and I started with just asking, well, what happened? What, what actually have been the, some of the signature events that mark the reasons why the climate is so bad? Silence. Utter silence. So I asked again, so tell me a little bit about what campus life is like for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell me the stories. Now, I knew what they were because they'd been already reported. Still, nobody would say anything. So then I said, well, so is everybody happy? Everything good? <laughs> Everything fine? Well, no, people started nodding their heads. So finally, someone started telling some of the stories. And one of the stories um, was actually a, a, an assault uh, that happened on a bus. Um, a campus bus um, that was both a sexist and a racial assault against an Asian American woman. Um, and some of the people who were in the room were on the bus. So I asked them, well, what did you say? They said nothing. So, well, why didn't you say anything? I mean, why, why is this conversation so hard to have? And then people started saying things like, well, you know, we don't want to be seen as angry. Mm. Um, we, we, we don't want to be seen as, you know, sort of out there. Um, basically, we don't want to be seen as activists. We don't want to be seen as people who are, you know, carrying, you know, a, a lot of baggage. We want to be seen like everybody else. So what was really puzzling to me is when and how did people get the message that it's more important to be seen like everybody else mm -hmm. rather than being able to denounce injustice when they see it and to even defend themselves, much less everybody else. So as we started talking about it, it became clear that one of the things that's been internalized is this notion of post-racism, post-feminism, post-intersectionality. I want to know when we got to, to the post, right? Yeah, right? When did we solve it so now we could say all of that was yesterday? Because I don't see it anywhere in the world just yet. Yeah. So my vision is, first of all, we do away with the post, mm -hmm. right? And we bring these movements together in a way that allows us to build the strength, uh, the strength of, the, of the collectivity, be able to see the connections between what we're doing. It might be that we still do the different things we do. So we still work on immigration if we're immigrant rights activists. We work on um, rape and sexual violence if we're um, anti-violence activists. But what we do and what we recognize is where those things intersect so that we're better allies to each other, so we're multilingual across many different issues. That would be, for me, the real post, right? The post-denial to get to the point where we recognize what's really confronting us. Thank you. Eve. I mean, when I think of what is it that creates a welcome table for as many people as possible to share the meal of justice, if you will, or the meal of organizing, or the meal of power, I think of the vagina monologues. There's something that you did about how you wrote and created that play, and then how you implemented its production as a worldwide movement that has been welcoming to millions of women, and some men too, at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's not forget all the genders in between in my intersectional dream, we recognize all of them. Um, to you, are there, what did you learn? Is it just accident in your case that it's set up this way? Well, I think a couple of things. I think what the vagina models and the whole journey's taught me is that um, a couple of things. You know, people laugh and cry at the same places, right? And it doesn't matter who they are or where they are in the world, I can close my eyes in that play in any language and people cry and laugh at the same places. That was a big revelation. It really was. Um, the second thing I learned is that when you actually open up and give something to people with generosity and freedom, um, people really like it. And they join you. They join you. But one of the things I was thinking about, um, and this is really, I was thinking about like, how do we build movements? How, what's, the, what's, the, what's at the base of it? And I think part of it is making a, a commitment from your heart that you're not going to leave. Mm. You see, I think it gets rough for all different kinds of us in all different ways, and we leave. You know, as a white woman who tries to make intersectional and has profound relationships with women of color, I get attacked from all different sides all the time. And it's painful. It's really painful. 
And I want to go sometimes. I want to go to the ashram. It's my little fantasy. I want to go. But I made a commitment on a deep level in my heart to that struggle. And that means I, I hang in there for the struggle. Mm -hmm. And whatever that brings, I keep going and I learn and I go deeper and I open further. And sometimes it feels unbearable, like I don't know how to do the next step. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to share a relationship I have with my sister, Christine Schuler, describer in the Congo. And I've learned a lot um, from everything that's happened with our work and our love and our, mm -hmm. our, our connection to our sisters in the Congo. And the way Vide works, there's only 14 paid people, and I'm a volunteer, and we work from our homes. And we just try to love and send out and connect with people the way we can. And when we started building the City of Joy, and the women of Congo built it, and they own it, and they direct it, we just sat and we said, what do you need, right? And what they said we needed is we need you at our backs, we need resources, and basically we need you to get out of our way, because we know what we're doing, right? And sometimes you want to be in the way because you want to be important, and you want to say, I'm here, and look at me, I'm doing this. But that's not what they wanted. They wanted us to get out of the way. So part of it is listening to what people want from you, and trying to show up in the way people want you to show up. Mm -hmm. And I call Christine every single day. I call her every single day. And I need her to know, and she needs to know, that I'm at her back, and that I have her back, and that we'll have resources, and we'll have love, and we'll have whatever she needs whenever she needs it. And what I do is I sit there at her back. And for me, it's been the most gorgeous practice of my life because I've learned how to love. I've learned how to get out of the way. And I think we all have to teach each other how to do that more, how to be out each other's back and commit for the long struggle. So you can get pissed at me. You can say, get out of here. But I'm in it with you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to give up because we're lazy in America. We're lazy. We don't, read the, we don't read, we don't think, we don't go all the way. We want everything in a sound bite and a Twitter feed. That's not how it is, love and connections. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. You've got to really go in there. So my intersexual dream is that <laughs> we really love each other and we hang in there for each other, for whatever it is, and we make that commitment on the deepest level. Mm. Ashley, you're the, you're the community organizer. Um, how do you do it? What tools have you used to keep these incredible coalitions together, to keep people who each have plenty of priorities in their own silos working together and believing that there's something to fight for more important as a group than individually? Yeah, I think that I've, I didn't know I was having intersectional dreams, <laughs> but I have been having them. Um, <laughs> An intersectional strategy as well. Um, you know, I feel like I said this a little bit earlier, but I, I think I have to repeat it. When I said that we have to broaden that idea of violence and violence of poverty, violence of patriarchal capitalism, violence of racism, um, violence of criminalization, I think that's important because it acknowledges that there are systems, right? and that there's institutions that must be held accountable for their actions and the hardships and the harms that's being caused on communities. So when I think about the vision, um, I think about building a broad movement um, led by those who are most impacted, mm -hmm. right? Demanding what they need um, and having them define it. So having the right to self-determination um, is something that I think I want to acknowledge your peeps in the audience, because when you talk about people having each other's back, show us your nice sign that you have. <laughs> you got this. We love you, Ashley. All right, for people watching at home, you got this. We love you, Ashley. Ashley, you rock. Ashley D for president. Support people. For president? <laughs> yeah. Is that, wait, is that really a question? Sure. <laughs> um, well, uh, no. <laughs> I think that uh, there's so much work to be done right here in South LA, so much work um, that expands beyond South LA, and I think the organizing um, is where my heart is. I feel like it's where I'm having the most impact. And, I don't just see it as something connected to this land, but across borders as well. 
Um, so I want to continue to develop and grow um, through the young people that are here in the audience um, and see and build up a big battle of fighters. So, yeah, I'll be right here. All right. If you, if you need me, I'm in South LA. <laughs> Got it. Where do we want to go next? Where we're going a week from now is to the rising. A week from now. Is everybody feeling a week from now, one billion rising? If you reach out, and why don't you do this? Reach out to the people on either side of you. I know it's a little touchy-feely, but you know. I, I want you to think about. All right. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Talk about permission. They just want the permission to reach out and touch somebody. I want you to think about two things. The, the number. The number that inspired Eve in the very first place to th start thinking about One Billion Rising was one in three. Well, you're connected with your two hands to three people, if you include yourself, which we urge you to do. One in three will be raped or assaulted in their lifetime. We know statistics are tricky. It's something in that region. One in three. One billion, that adds up to. One billion are going to rise next week. Are you feeling it? <laughs> kind of like that impossible rain. Are you feeling impossible justice? <laughs> so let's talk about concrete steps. We <laughs> just put about 10 more minutes and then we'll play you the incredible One Billion Rising video that just premiered at Sundance Film Festival. You'll all go dancing out into the streets, but you, 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 are the, you are incredible models, all of you. And I would love to hear... <laughs> one glimpse from each of you of, of the justice that keeps you going. You know, sometimes I think about those Rosa Parks stories, or I think about your um, high schoolers who don't even have the vote, and yet you're figuring out how to change the city council. Rosa Parks. What gave her the idea that possibly it was worth protesting rape? Uh, and if you haven't read the extraordinary book at the dark end of the street, I encourage you to read it about the intersectional roots, actually roots in the African-American women's community of the civil rights movement, in the, in the movement against violence against women. Um, what gives us I the idea that it's worth fighting, as somebody said today, that justice is worth fighting for? Um, is a glimpse sometimes that we see of it. And I don't know whether it's in a fictional movie that you may be part of or in an experience that you had. Uh, give us a glimpse that you've seen of the kind of justice uh, that you think is out there just beyond our reach. Olivia? Well, Eve wrote a book called The Good Body, which is fantastic and I recommend it. And in it are stories of women from all different cultures talking about their bodies. And there was one where the title comes from of a woman, where was she from, who said that every day she thanks her body and says, good body, good body. I can't remember, but it was like the most <laughs> profound thing that I read the story of this other woman. And it had this effect on me that I started doing that to myself on a regular basis, just saying like, thanks legs for walking and thanks for being there for me, arms. <laughs> Uh, you know, just being grateful in that way, and it came from the influence of another woman. And I really think that that small experience, personal experience, gives me hope that the effect that we can have on each other if we have a community, and particularly of women, and I think really the community that needs it most is in Hollywood. Within Hollywood, there is no community of actresses who come together and talk about their power as a whole. This is something that I really believe in and is, I think, responsible for so much damage that trickles out from there. Um, and so I really believe that the effect that women can have on other women in terms of being pro-woman, in terms of stopping this kind of judgment that we perpetuate on each other and we, then we blame men or we blame the media when a lot of it is in our own hands. And so I think about, you know, a woman's story of being good to herself, making me want to be good to myself, and how that effect can ripple out from me, and that community that I want to build, and how hopefully that will have a, a positive effect. And it gives me hope. I feel really hopeful about it. Mm. 
Susan, do I see you itching to go? Have you seen a glimpse of justice out there? <laughs> you are justice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see the, the real resiliency of the women and the community within the women that I work with every day. Um, I see the life. I see life reborn in an instant. I see the, the eyes off and then the eyes come on. And, um, you know, I know justice is, is, is on the horizon, finally, in the lives in which um, I'm blessed to be able to come in contact with. So, um, you know, that's the justice, the justice of seeing the community rise. When you have the 800% um, uh, in increase in the rate of incarceration for women, and you know that Johnny's mother is gone and the grandmother is filling in, and you no longer have a community where you used to say, uh, I'm going to call your mother. You better, you, you better stop that. That no longer exists because everybody is being caged um, down the road up near, you know, in, in, in the country. Well, yeah, Los Angeles has country too, <laughs> our desert. Um, and, you know, um, uh, you want to do, you want to have a hand in repairing that and bringing community back, bringing the women back to take the place, take their place, no longer experience violence, standing against violence and standing up for each other. But I see the light come back on and that's just a beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. Ashley. That's justice. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be that panelist that doesn't really answer the question, but as an organizer, I just have to. <laughs> I have to do this. Um, so again, when I think about women rising, um, I think just as Ms. Burden said it, as women fighting back, women being resilient. And so I need everyone in this room um, to help a lot of people who are rising here in Los Angeles. Yes. So there are a couple of things you can do from your house. But we'll prefer if you come in, you know, do stuff too. But the first thing is this. Um, our um, MTA is proposing to have a fare increase. Um, we need to fight it. Right now the bus pass is $75 um, a month. It's going to increase to about $135. Oh, wow. So that's and how, what was the uh, average income of the people that ride the bus? $14,000 a year. Right? So it's going to go up to 100 and then I think by the end, the increases it should be 135. So we need you all to call our great mayor, Mayor Garcetti. Um, and as he's sitting on MTA to say, mm -mm, not going to happen because we're rising up. And the second thing, you, have a number you, could give it you know, right now? I need those wonderful people to use Google. <laughs> <laughs> I bet one of your friends is going to use number. Google before the end of the night. <laughs> We will give that number um, because there's a lot of calling. Number two, <laughs> there is some money coming down from um, our governor uh, for our schools. And, you know, we as the Community Rights Campaign, LCSC, believe that money should be used for resources, um, mental health counselors, restorative justice for discipline, not increase policing inside yes. of our schools. Yes. So we need you all. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> uh, 213-978-0600. We'll make sure. Yeah. Yeah, tell them that I said it. And then tell this person, too, I need you to call Superintendent Daisy of our school district and tell him that we need resources, not policing. And policing isn't resources. I heard a story. Uh, <laughs> we just have to go to after that, and then I'm coming to you, Eve. No, but I just wa I, I wanted to make a suggestion that there could be a rising at the mayor's office. I am so for that. OK. OK. okay. Let's organize that. Okay. I will organize <laughs> Okay. <laughs> to make that happen. Um, so Lindsay, the mayor's going to be rising yeah. with us. Yeah, oh. 
okay, right. Uh, nice. Let's now we can ride just the make bus a visitation. <laughs> this could be an intersectional rising. <laughs> And there's one last person, and I promise this is it. All right. So there's an amazing group um, that's in Sheriff's Violence Coalition that's fighting for civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Department. And we need you all to call, um, so I'm really bad with the last name. I hope they're not watching right now. So Zev, who's on, yes, that, one, that last name, on the County Board of Supervisors. Um, and. Yeah, let them know that we need that civilian oversight. Say the name again. Zeb. Zeb Yaroslavsky. <laughs> exactly it. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. I have to say, Gail, I hear the word sheriff. I hear the word budgets. I hear the word persuasion, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I think you had a justice glimpse not so long ago. Yeah, we had a, a, a real shift in terms of... Um, how the, uh, the money that every county has coming to it uh, in California due to AB 109 and the uh, criminal justice um, realignment, um, we had a certain amount of money coming to our county and the sheriff wanted to put that money into building a new jail. But our community said, no, we want it into re-entry services. And so, so we went, so uh, we went and I was right there with them and we went to all the hearings and the, the meetings and we spoke and we held signs and um, you know I had because I was mayor I had an opportunity to say a few words on, on behalf of the community and eventually the sheriff caved and he did support mon the money for the uh, reentry services. Now we have a huge coalition working on how to spend that money, uh, a one-stop center. Um, it's, again, an example of how a community in action um, can really, really cause that shift to and occur. And who was the we? Who did all that? We had a huge uh, coalition of community groups, Cisco. Um, we have a group called the Safe Return Team in Richmond. Um, we have uh, an out, outreach team. So we've shifted our, our crime in Richmond from um, uh, last year we only had 16 homicides, the lowest in 33 years. We had 61 in um, 1991 or something. And we are showing the trend because we address the roots of the violence. Mm -hmm. We're really showing that that works. So um, it is a justice issue. It's clear that, um, that when people unite and when they have representation that stands with them and when they put forward that pressure and that they don't give up, and that they have art. I just wanted to say this about another intersection, the intersection between art and politics. Mm -hmm. It's an important one, you know? We have to, you know, we have people here who have written books and, 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 and an actor, and you know, that's, it's so clear that that, that art um, is like a, a, a transition to people coming together. And the Vagina Monologues is a perfect example of, of art creating a bigger movement, you know? So it's uh, your creative talent as young people, you know? The creative talent of each of us as human beings has to be tapped into, and, and, and uh, we will make that change that we know we can. So. <laughs> Our county did the opposite. Mm -hmm. They have invested the majority in, of the resources in policing, in jails, and not reentry services, or restorative justice, or um, arts. It didn't go to the, to, to, to the places it really needed to go to uh, transform what's happening. So we need you to go on to the LA County Board of Supervisors website and hit that link and email all of them and let them know that we need reentry services, not more, more policing, not, not more jails. Uh, they're slated to build one. So they're asking to build one. And we are organizing, and we are showing up. But you know, we need more. So I'm asking you to go onto the LA County Board of Supervisors and say, no new jails. We need reentry services. We need a, an investment in the communities where people are coming from. Kim, closing thoughts from you or glimpses of justice, Kim and then Eve. Um, so for those 
supporters of the anti-violence movement who wonder why we're talking about jails in the context of violence, violence. right? Violence. Um, and, and, I, and I believe that there's some, some people who really have those reservations. One, one thing just to make clear, the emphasis on jail and incarceration as a solution to violence, domestic violence in particular, has not been shown to be effective. In fact, the studies show that um, the incidents of homicide go up dramatically um, when incarceration is the primary mode of intervention. Right? Um, this has been a story that has been told by women of color for the last 20 years. We need more proactive uh, remedies to violence, not necessarily as the first resort incarceration. And we also know that the entire effort to try to handle the problem of uh, drugs and other dependencies by uh, punitive measures only creates more. So even if you say, look, I'm not quite sure if my interests go as far as mass incarceration, understand that to actually realize the vision of a society that's free of violence, you have to be concerned about mass incarceration. You have to be concerned about the deflection of these resources to more incarceration. They are connected. They are connected. So, so when I think about where, where we might go with this, I, I, there used to be a radio show called And the Rest of the Story, where this guy would tell a story, and you, you, you waited to the end to hear the rest of the story. I want next year to be And the Rest of the Story. I want to know what actually came from some of the risings that happened. I want us to have a mapping. What's so exciting about this is seeing literally every hour something else is coming in from somewhere around the world where people are doing action. That's exciting enough. But if next year we could say, now this is what came of it, we have a mapping not just of the rising, but we have a mapping of justice. We have, we have a visualization of what we were able to do collectively and recognize, as Eve said, 14 people are facilitating it. It doesn't mean 14 people are directing it. It means that people are ready on the ground It'll to work do it. stuff, right? It's right, the time is happening and things are moving. So if we could actually have a way of aggregating mm. all of that, that's what makes us more excited. That's what makes us more powerful. And I do know that there's some, some projects in the room. I know that I have some students here at UCLA who are yeah. going to dance. Where are you guys going to dance? Where are you going on? The 14th, yell it out so everyone knows. <coughs> you guys. Right For people on. that right. here, they're going to the California Youth Facility, the youth prison right here in, 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 in uh, Los Angeles. Lindsay should yell, yell out a couple other places where they'll be rising. And we have a new, we have a new ask from him. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Um, All right. So you're rising, you're taking back the sacrament, you're taking back the city, you're taking back the soldiers and the studios. Well, I want to say that I see glimpses of justice when I hear people listen, as you've listened tonight. When we listen to the quietest voice, not just the loudest voice. When we listen the first time, not wait for the last time, somebody yells help. 
That's where I see a glimpse of justice. And I want to thank you all for being such an incredible audience. I want to thank this panel, which is not quite yet done, but I want to thank this panel for being as generous to each other and to everybody watching at home as they've been, and incredibly genius as well as generous. Thank you all. And I want to thank you, Eve, for all the work you've done, all the heart you've given, all the inspiration you've given, uh, and all the invitation you've given to us to be our best selves. Thank you. Thank you. Take us out. Take us out with some of your vision. I also want to just thank Laura Flanders, who thank is you, so rocky. Yes. Yes. I want to share a story to close with, because um, I think I hear people say to me all the time, oh, I don't do what you do. I only do this. I don't, it, there's always this self-diminishing thing that happens. And I really believe in the power of each one of us to transform human consciousness and reality. And I want to tell the story of a woman at City of Joy. Um, because every morning I get up and I complain for a second. I think of her and I shut up. Um, I met Jane seven years ago at Pansy Hospital. And she had been um, raped in her village. And I'm telling her story. She has told her story publicly, and she has given me permission to tell her story. She was raped in her village um, very badly, and she came to Pansy Hospital to be healed because her body was very destroyed. And she was fixed after months and months and months, and she was sent home. And when she was sent home, the militias came to her house, the corporate militias who were there getting resources that belonged to the Congolese, but are being taken by the world and using women's bodies to get them. And when they came to her house, um, they invaded it, and she was tied to a tree for two months. She was raped every day by gangs and militia. She watched her uncle's body be cut in half and fall in front of her to the ground. I'm telling this story because when they found Jane, she was barely a body. They had to bring her in a basket to the city of Joy, into the hospital, because she couldn't even be moved without her body falling apart. She was operated on many, 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 many times. And I have no idea. She said to me, I have no idea what my body is anymore. She said to me when I first met her, all we want in the Congo is for you to help us build a place where we can rise and determine our own realities, just like Ashley was saying. Where we can grow, where we can become, where we can heal, where we can be our best selves. And she came to the first session, and she healed. And I watched her heal. And I watched her grow, and I watched a community surround her with so much love, with so much love, that she was literally filled with her love. So it surpassed her body. It went beyond her body. And at the first graduation, she stood up and she was the most powerful leader I have ever seen. And she looked at the governor in his face and she said, end the violence. Stop the violence. And she was born. And now she is a leader at the City of Joy. She teaches there. She works there. And she is my inspiration. And what she taught me is we come into our bodies, but inside our bodies, when we are loved, it goes beyond the body, in the body at the same time. So my vision is that we look at the people next to us and we remember everybody is left out of something. Everybody has been disappeared. Everybody has been erased in one way or another. And our job is to see each other, to recognize each other and love each other, because that's how we'll rise. Yes. Thank you all. Valentine's Day, like me. Valentine's Day.
Dünya çapında 1 milyar kadın kadına şiddete